cool. So apparently the stream has started. Uh, we're going to give everyone a few minutes um, just as we all start to get settled. There's probably people coming in, checking things out. I'm going to wait for my cue from Charles Martin, your beloved course convener, uh, to tell me when to kick off my lecture. So I'm madly typing around. I'm just trying to see if I can find the chat channel that everyone's going to be uh, maybe heckling me on. Um, I'll just put something in that says hello everyone. So if you're a student, type in and let me know if you can see, which means I'll know if I'm in the right channel. Put a heater on. Hey, I'm getting some hellos from people. Hello back to all y'all. Hello is. This is fun. Who knew computers could do so much? Bring us all together. So maybe we'll wait till five past. All right, no, I've just seen from Charles. It's go time. Right on. All right, so hey, everybody. It's kind of weird to give a lecture like this. I'm used to Zoom lectures, so if I mess something up, please bear with me. Uh, my name is Dr. Tony Curran. I am a academic here at the ANU, and I'm usually more embedded in the School of Art and Design where I teach painting and I teach drawing and I teach model making and um, in how I've found my way here is because a lot of my painting and drawing starts in a very digital process and through a few channels I've um, been brought into computer science a little bit through a fellowship that started a collaboration between myself and the the many great people in computer science, research school of computer science. And um, you are in 1720 or 6720, and while this is a computer science course, it's also a course where it's gonna be really important that you start to think a little bit around how to make it a work of art. And a work of art is a pretty um, hard thing to define. And so I'm kind of here to give one lecture a week that will help guide you in the right directions of how you can set up uh, as an artist, you know, down the track. 
Uh, so you, we've got 12 weeks where we're going to be, um, you're going to be learning new concepts in terms of coding, new ways that you can uh, use the p5.js library. And at the same time, you're going to be making these visual things and it might be a little bit uh, confusing for you to try and get yourself um, into the uh, into the swing of um, making uh, really interesting artworks. So, so that's my role here. Um, so if I don't quite understand something around the code side of things, that's because I'm not as expert as the other people on the Comp1720 team at that side of things, but I do, uh, I do try and do that. And I will be you know, continuing to look at what you've got happening with your labs uh, so that I can also incorporate some kind of content into the lecture series to help you think through how you might uh, approach the labs or how you might take the lab exercises and do something interesting with those in an artistic sense to build up your uh, capacity as artists. So I, I'm aware that um, there's usually a mix of students in this course that are um, computer science students, and then there's usually another stream of students that are within the School of Art and Design. So I hope that through the labs, you also have an opportunity to, um, and through the team's uh, sort of community, I hope you do get an opportunity to sort of cross communicate a lot of the things that you're dealing with and going through, uh, including, um, it, so if you're new to being, being forced to be an artist, uh, and there are students in your cohort that are fairly comfortable with that you know they're probably people to reach out to and develop some co-learning relationships with and if you are an art student or a design student and you kind of feeling a little intimidated or worried about um, how you're going to go with this sort of coding stuff um, you know I think building these relationships can be really productive so hopefully uh, you're not too uh, worried. Um, I've just seen in the chat that there's a message for me to turn up my mic. Um, is that a, can someone hit me up if uh, there's a better, if there's better advice for me to do that? Uh, let me just jump into system preferences real quick. Sound. Input. Okay, so let's, all right, so I've turned it up a little bit. Let me know if that's getting too loud. I don't want it to max out. Um, anyway, I hope that's a little bit better. Cool, so, so just quickly a little bit about myself. If you need to know more about me, you can jump onto my website, which is tonycurran.net. And you'll see that I am making these things that have a sort of digital sensibility to them. And if you want, you can um, scroll through that, find any kind of information. You're welcome to use this as a starting point to uh, start some conversations with your tutors about what, what artists you might want to look at. Um, I'm aware that if you're not in the habit of um, knowing where uh, to find artists, that, that can be an intimidating thing. And so part of my role is to help illuminate that for you. So this is a recent exhibition that I had uh, in Canberra at Tuggeranong Arts Centre earlier this year, which included, which was a collaborative exhibition with another local artist, Waratah Lay. It included prints, it included paintings, and it included these uh, little um, iPad uh, P5.js sketches, um, which I can show you one of. And it's, it's a super simple sketch. What it is, is it's a whole lot of circles with a certain kind of algorithm that tells it to draw circles all along one side of the screen and then and change color as it does that and then move up and down the screen periodically. And it creates these kind of curious landscapey or cloud-like formations. And it's simple, it's sort of colorful, it doesn't look exactly like a landscape. It doesn't look, um, you know, it, it's not the smartest looking thing. It's not precise. 
it's goofy, it's ambiguous, and I really like the simplicity of that. And I think one of the things that's really great about using something like the P5 library is that, uh, p5.js, is that it really gets you to think a little bit around, okay, given that I'm not drawing photorealistic portraits of people in this course, or given that I have access to a camera, or given that I'm using computers that have interactive potentials, what is the thing that I want to achieve with art? Like what, what can be interesting art that is made um, using this kind of process? So a big part of what we're going to talk about is what art is, what art isn't as well, um, and what you can do to sort of just take these little moments, these little ideas that are um, brought up with the, uh, each of the labs, and then also the assignments. So you, you'll notice that there's a range of assignments that include making still images, so making still graphics, and there are other uh, images, there are other assignments that involve making some kind of interactive advertisement, and then you've also got a major project where you get to really um, explore in depth uh, your own project that is going to be some kind of work of art um, in and of itself. So I think it's really important that we start off with an idea of what art is. And I'm just going to go to slide one. Oops, no, that went to slide 16. All right, I've just given away my whole game there. All right, so let's start with this question, uh, what is art? And I think um, we are now living in an age where there is a sort of belief that anything can be art and that art can be anything. But I don't know if that's true because I make things in the studio that are interesting, but then I make things that are really uninteresting. And so there are certain things that I am excited to put in an exhibition and there are certain things that I'm really not excited to put in an exhibition. Uh, so this raises this question, you know, what, what is art? Is art just anything that anybody makes and therefore everything that anybody makes is great and fantastic and art? Or is there this sort of distinction between, no, there's this like stuff that, you know, is magical and special and then there's this other stuff that's, you know, craft. Do we want to say that there's art and then there's craft? Do we want to say that there's like art and design and craft? Do we want to say that they're all equal? How do we think about this? Um, and what what is the difference between a good artwork and a bad artwork? And that's a lot of what we're going to um, explore in these lectures. So I want you to have a go at that question now. Um, I'll keep talking. I think there's about a 45 second lag. So if you can write in the chat something about um, what you think art is. And uh, we'll, we'll see if uh, we come up with any responses that are the same. So maybe some of you will have the same idea of what art is and what art can be. Um, but for me, this is kind of my definition of art that I work towards. It's, it's when something is done so well that it exceeds the function of the thing that it is for. All right, so that's quite a mouthful. Uh, another way to think of it is an artwork has a surplus or excess je ne sais quoi. So it has a surplus or an excess. It, it's more than what it needs to be. Um, we've got Anson's tie, Anson Ties, art equals visual expression of an idea. Interesting, that's fantastic. I like that word expression. Um, let's see if there's any more. Um, so when I say that art is something that exceeds the function of the thing that it is for, I'm allowing that to be that art can be a thing that has a function, but that the art is where the thing exceeds the function. So let's take the idea of a drawing, for example. We've all seen drawings that are drawings, but they're not art. And we've all seen art that's not a drawing. So 
what might be an example of a drawing that is an art. It could be a map that I draw for someone to enable them to find their way to a shop. Or it could be a screen grab that I make in order to uh, tell Charles Martin that I'm having difficulties with teams and to ask for his advice on a problem with that. Um, so there's a, there's a number of ways that we can create things that we consider like pictures and those kinds of things, but there's usually a distinction that we make between those things and, and art at some point. Um, we've got some really great responses happening here actually. Um, something that is aesthetically pleasing, although sometimes it might be the opposite on purpose. That's great, I love that. Um, visual expression of an idea, uh, we've read that, uh, that's a, but that's a really good, concise thing to think about. Um, a way to convey or express emotion or an idea, that's interesting. Go Julian. Something that makes people feel good. Um, I love Benedict's definition. I don't know about art, but I know what I like. That's the caricature gallerist, or not gallerist, the caricature collector of walking into a gallery and just picking things and not caring what other people think of what they, what they buy. I love it. We've got a form of communication between artists and their audience with aesthetic beauties, which can be a, very, a thing very standard or personal. Great. Something that can elicit an emotion I don't know, I'm not artsy. Great, but I'm glad you had a go. Um, something that is pleasing and something that isn't. Uh, Julian's kind of doubling down on, a, on another definition. Um, but what if the function of the artwork is to be realistic? Is it not art? It hasn't necessarily exceeded its function. Um, something that provides the viewer, reader insights and resonates. Uh, in my opinion, it can be anything that comes down to whether it's intentionally presented as art or just a thing. Right. So if I put something somewhere and I say this is art, maybe that is just all that we need to do. It needs the declaration by an artist that it's, a, that it's art. Um, so a bit of love for the top definition. I'll just uh, recap that one. I've lost it. Something that is aesthetically pleasing, although sometimes it might be the op opposite on purpose. So also find very practical things to be art. To me, a beautiful painting is art, but an industrialist building may be art too. I don't know what I would define as art because I find too many exceptions in my definition. Exactly. So it's a really hard thing to say, this is art. And so everything that is going to be considered art has to fit within these categories in these criteria. Um, something that reflects something about the world we live in. So all of these are really good sort of angles to look at art. And I feel like you could sort of put these all down into a mind map and then start to get really quite critical about, okay, What's an example of something that is a visual expression of an idea? What are all the, what are all the things that could be a visual expression of an idea? Um, and then f uh, which of those are art and which are not? I love this one that art is something that can elicit an emotion. I think there's something really powerful in that. When we, when we like art, it's emotional. It's not logical. And so we, we fall in love with a painting or a sculpture or a piece of software or whatever it is, uh, and it creates a desire for us to engage with it. Um, so in a sense, we can, we can have that experience with a cup. We can have that experience with a building as, as someone's mentioned before. And so there's something in excess of the function or the thing or the sort of visual description of something there's something in excess of that uh, thing, that function, that creates an emotional sort of connection between us and the object. Or in our case, us and the program that we're, that we're making. Um, and Benedict's uh, 
comments, does art only encompass things that are visual? So what about music? Is music art? So when we think about art, often we shortcut this to ideas about visual art, visual painting, sculpture, those kinds of things. But then there are other senses and there's, um, you know, we, we hear the I ideas of the art of cooking and the art of, so there's arts of things as well. Um, these are really great definitions and so keep them coming while I keep going. So when I say it has a certain surplus or excess, you know, the, the English language has really struggled to come up with a word that defines this. And so we borrow this word, je ne sais quoi, from the French. And it literally means, I don't know what. Je ne sais quoi means, I don't know what. Um, so it has a quality that we just can't quite put our finger on. Um, but we know it when we see it. For example, when if I showed you these two images and I said, which of these is art? And you had to choose one. You couldn't say neither. I suspect that most of you would choose the one on the left. So if you would choose one on the left, write in the chat something about why you would choose the one on the left rather than the one on the right. There's this term latte art and there's latte artists. I remember coming out of art school and there was sandwich artists that could be hired at Subway. Um, so we'll come back to some of the responses there. And then this one, which of these is art? And I suspect that most of you are going to suggest that art is the thing, is the object on the right, which is uh, Merritt Oppenheim's object. It's a fur, cu fur covered cup, saucer and spoon. So Merritt Oppenheim has taken a cup and a saucer and a spoon and covered those objects in fur and called it an object. And she did this in 1936. So je ne sais quoi means I don't know what. There's a certain quality there that I can't really um, say is what makes something art and makes everything else art as well. So in, we also use this Latin word, which is the sublime. And to talk about the sublime, and I will talk about this in another week, but the sublime sometimes means like a sort of horrifying moment. But sometimes in other contexts, it actually just means when something is sublime, it means something is elevated. It's elevated to another level. And that's what that excess is. The excess pushes something to another level. So it's week one. You're going to be uh, dealing with Your, your lab is going to be putting a circle on the internet. You're going, to, you're going to be this proud little munchkin here who went to uni and put a circle on the internet. Um, it seems like a really simple thing to do, but imagine if you can put one circle on the internet, that means you can put two circles on the internet. And once you put two circles on the internet, you can copy and paste that to put four circles on the internet. So one circle on the internet can proliferate into a large uh, gamut of things. So how do you keep that interesting? And what I want you to take away from today is that no matter what you do week to week, I want you to, to think about, okay, what is the most interesting thing that I can do with this tool? So at the end of your lab, I hope you don't finish up going, cool, put a circle on the internet, I've ticked that box. I want you to think about something like what would Sonia Deloni have done when she put a circle, if she, if she lived long enough to put a circle on the internet. This is one of her works called Prism Electrique uh, from 1914. Uh, Sonia Deloni and her husband Robert Deloni were artists that were part of the, um, the movement called Orphism. Uh, so early 20th century abstraction in the early 20th century, there was a big sort of push to uh, sort of spiritual perspectives that 
intersected with electronic um, interventions in cities. So lamp posts, electric light, and then with electric light came a whole lot of new ideas around how color relationships work. And Sonia Delaunay was would paint these circles that sort of overlapped in these patterns in order to really test color and test the test what colors do when they sit right next to each other. How do they create a, a, a strange vibration? So put how many circles would this be? And what kind of alphas or color modes would you use to do this? Um, Jody Cunningham is a Canberra artist here uh, uh, here in Canberra. And she also investigates the circle in numerous ways. This is uh, designed for a gateway arch crown for Woolley Street Project. So if any of you uh, ever head over to Dixon to do your shopping or to sample many of the delicious restaurants on offer in Canberra, um, you, you might notice this. It's a sort of uh, multicultural celebratory uh, work that builds on Jody Cunningham's career-long interrogation of the circle. And so it's not just Jody has come up with the idea of I'm going to use some circles uh, for this project. Jody's been exploring circles for years. And when looking at an artist who's played with circles for a long time, you can look at their work and download a lot of the knowledge that they have about what they think art is in relation to a circle and you can then apply some of that knowledge. So here we have concentric circles, we have circles that are segmented and then circles that come off other circles to create, you know, kind of petals of circles and flowers and the, the scale and intricacy um, can shift the design. Jasper Johns in 1955 um, painted things that were icons. They were flat things. He painted a lot of flags. In this example, he painted targets, uh, and he was really interested in the idea of flatness versus non-flatness. And so this is Jasper Johns taking on the circle in his kind of way. Uh, Bridget Riley, this is her work, Hesitate, from 1964. It's emulsion on board. Um, what, what kind of effect do you see this type of painting having? Is this a, uh, is it a pretty work? Is it a invigorating work? How does it make you feel? Put a comment in the chat. Uh, this isn't Bridget Riley's only circular work. Um, we can see here that she's also in 1970 painting ideas around the circle to uh, play with some of those ideas that we saw Son Sonia Delaunay playing with, where if you combine, if you make a pink circle inside a blue circle, how is that different to making a yellow circle inside a blue circle? What quality does that make, does that create? Or, and then how is that different from a yellow circle inside of a pink circle? And how is that different from a blue circle inside of a pink circle? And then how does the arrangement of these in a rectangle create a composition that gets an, a viewer to continuously just watch and look at this rectangle? So as artists, we're really trying to uh, create the habit of looking. We're trying to give someone an excuse to look at something. And the more that we can do that, uh, the better. And so the tools that we have here in the P5JS library give us more than visual. So that, that comment about, is it just visual? What, it, what kinds of experiences does the um, P5JS library offer us? Does it offer us sound? Does it offer us um, bodily connections? How do, how do you engage a user's body? And in Bridget Riley's case, she engages a user's body by giving us these repeated patterned forms that you can almost feel with your eyes. You don't just see them as an image, but you, they sort of burn into your retina 
in, in a sense like a, like a screen cam. Okay, uh, so, so that's kind of the, uh, actually before I go on, the one thing I would also say about all of these artists is that Bridget Riley has learnt from them and what she decided uh, in 1961 when she made this work was she was out of ideas in the studio and this was her groundbreaking painting. She was in the studio by herself, she'd done a lot of paintings and things that she wasn't happy with and she was completely out of ideas. And she, she wrote a little essay about this painting where she says that she didn't know what to do, so she drew a square. And then after she drew that square, she decided to draw another square. And then between those two squares, she noticed something. And so she drew another square that interacted with those squares. And then she just started kept drawing squares. And then the more she drew squares, the more she started to... Um, see how squares could be played with and toyed with to then arrive at something that is far more than a painting of squares. And the title Movement in Squares gives us a clue as to what she's uh, aiming at, which is that with movement in a static form, she's trying to create a sense of dynamism uh, and she's using like contrast and she's using this sort of concave illusion to create this sense of movement but she does this playfully she hasn't arrived at this she hasn't said I'm going to make a painting that does this she thinks okay I'm going to draw a square and then I'm going to draw another square and then I'm going to draw another square and then I'm going to start to think about what's happening and then I'm going to build based on that so let's go back and see if anyone's got any more Oh, I love this. Art is a combination of vulnerability and effort. A personal stake. Yes, the heroic, heroic art. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> art, something that Julian likes. I can run with that. Nice one, Benedict. Great. Um, the one on the left is unique. So we're talking about the, uh, we're back to the, lattes and required a lot of skill to do okay so skills becoming a factor that's true for the right as well and if i'd seen the right for the first time i'd probably call it art too chong chen says it's more creative that's the reason more creative less less like everything else um Samuel, I think the idea that art is so hard to define is what makes art so interesting. When you define something, you create boundaries around what something has to be to qualify. The lack of boundaries is what makes art interesting. This is great. All right, I won't spend too long on that, but keep typing them up because I think it's really useful fodder. So, I mean, it, it raises this question, if we, can't, if we don't want to put boundaries around art, is art just random? Like, is, are there any rules? Are there no rules? This is um, Blue Poles from 1952 by Jackson Pollock, which uh, sits in the National Gallery of Australia. And it was the first painting in the world, I believe, ever sold, ever purchased for more than a million dollars. And our Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam, was in a lot of trouble in the public media stuff about for having sort of wasted money on this thing that looked like just a random splatter of, of paint. So we're going to look at randomness next week. We're going to look at random chance. Um, later, we're going to look at color. How do you use color? Do you use color randomly? Is there a science behind color? Are there theories that you can use? There are lots of designers that have these rules about color that they use, uh, building a palette um, and sticking to that. Uh, so we're going to play with what is the right way to think about color and what is the kind of, and when I say the right way, uh, what do different ways of thinking offer us as artists? So when you're making your sketches, you can be empowered to know, okay, I will try this procedure with color. We're gonna look at how to judge art as well. Um, so we've 
talked a little bit about what we think art is. And we're also going to talk a little bit about what art isn't. So what doesn't get to be included in art. And this is um, a kind of uh, work that often would be dismissed as not art. This is a screen grab from this video game called Katamari Damacy. I chose this one because once I named an artwork after, the, after this video game, and at another point, like I just remember 20 years ago, I was playing this with friends all the time. The, the concept around Katamari was that you start, you, you're this little ball on the ground and you roll around and you collect dust and then that dust makes you bigger and fatter and then at the next level you are like the size of an object in a room and you roll around and you collect things and then you're the size of almost a house and then gradually each level as you sort of collect things that are smaller than you to make you bigger you get bigger and you can collect bigger things and then eventually you're as big as a planet and you collect a solar system but you've got to like spend a lot of time doing this it's a really simple idea and you're not killing anybody you don't have any enemies it's just you trying to get bigger and bigger um, and it's an example of uh, a, a piece of software that is in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York and so we will we'll talk a little bit about whether this should be art or whether this shouldn't be art but one of the really great um, ways to think about it is we have institutions that have experts who consider these questions all the time and they wonder okay what should go into our art collection and they like study everything that they can and they learn as much as they can about an object before they collect it into a, uh, a really prestigious collection um, and when they do that they are making a declaration of what of them saying this is a work of art that needs to be um, preserved as art so you'll see that they've collected quite a few um, pieces of software including a Minecraft work um, so feel free to go through there there's Katamari Damacy um, Gotham so they've got 72 software collections and some of these are going to be familiar to you as games or software others are going to be like so this is a wall installation sculpture thing by Raphael Lozana Hammer but here's The Sims and um, and Will Wright is listed as an author or artist of uh, this piece of software um, here are a series of fonts um, more results so they have 72 pieces of software in their collection so this is a good place to start thinking about say interactive art and the boundary of whether interactive art and get like what is the boundary between a game and an artwork um, so that that's a great resource and museum collections are a big part of that and in making those judgments we're going to think about okay well there is what's art and what's not art and then there's the question of what is good art and what is not good art uh, we're going to look at Maplethorpe who was derided by certain members of the population for making um, homosexual is, is how it was labeled uh, by um, a lot of politicians and conservative opinion pollsters that uh, that this was this an image like this is not art because they thought it was obscene because it reflected LGBT uh, QI plus culture but also at the same time it's very classically beautiful so if someone thinks something is obscene can it still be beautiful and if it can still be if it's beautiful does it mean it can't be obscene um, and then how do we read obscenity or how do we how do we you know put values around uh, which people get represented and which people don't um, so we, we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll look at, uh, you know, interactivity. We'll look at people like Raphael Rosendahl. And I've picked out a few of his um, circle, circle works, but there's a whole web page of various websites that Raphael Rosendahl has put together. Here's a few circles just for this week. Here is a cup that generates loads of circles. And then they go and they spill out. 
And here is another of his websites that um, uses circles as a sort of design element to create something that in this day and age has become an object of immense value. Some cool responses about um, Bridget Riley. Sorry, I'm a little slow on the uptake with that. And I love to, yeah, I'll let you play with that. Uh, so Raphael Rosendahl, some, so these are some resources to get you sort of a little taster, a little amuse-bouche of the course. We're going to talk about uh, this work, Somebody by Miranda July, which was a social media platform that was an artwork made by Miranda July is a, is a performance artist and filmmaker and many things and she made this very curious social media app that re that creates a very strange encounter with the user um, so at what point is social media an artwork but then also we're going to think about okay if we are thinking about, okay, what is the difference between art and non-art, how do we talk about that? Because a big part of your assessments, um, well, maybe not a big part, but a, an important part of your assessments are how you are able to explain what you did, explain how you thought about it, what, what kinds of decisions that you made and why you made those decisions. And the more... Um, in the, the more sophisticated you are, so the more you know about the, the field of art and interaction in new media, the more uh, you can sort of demonstrate the research that you've undertaken to make the thing that you've made. And so we'll use this app as a case study for how to talk about art. We'll look at audio. We'll look at various things that you can do with um, sort of an experience, you know, we're working with p5.js, which means that we're making websites that are phone friendly. Um, what does portability mean? Uh, how do we make audio experiences that go beyond, um, that maybe go beyond music, um, that put a listener into an unusual space uh, and maximize what we can out of the p5.js library. We're going to look at, uh, for the advertising components of, of your assignment, we're going to look at the idea of hooking someone. So this is where we're really going to look at this idea of how do you create an interactive experience that someone doesn't ever want to put down. And there's some really interesting ideas that um, are used in social media but also video game culture that hook people so that they always keep coming back to use that thing. Um, just like Bridget Riley's, you know, circles and squares. Um, it's going to be really important to consider, you know, we've talked about uh, creative expression and we're going to need to think about at what point is the computer producing the expression and at what point are us the artists creating the expression so what is the um, what is the difference between an artist and the computer is the computer generating the art or is the computer automating certain tasks that the artist needs to do and so finally just for a little bit of a case study because we might look at works by Bridget Riley and think okay it's a lot of squares that's easy to do blah 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 but oftentimes, and, and this is certainly the case with uh, Bridget Riley and Piet Mondrian and Jody Cunningham and others, is an artist usually starts an investigation that lasts a lifetime. Okay, so let's put this in scale, in scope. You are a first, first second or third year, or maybe you're a master's. Anyway, you're a university student, you're taking this course, and maybe you've never made an artwork before. So this might be your first step. So let's just have a look at a few steps that someone like Piet Mondrian would have made in 1909. He made this image of a tree and he was really trying to use color to get to some universal truth about the world. And red is a very like life generating color. And he was thinking about um, 
this red tree as this sort of life-giving force against the dead of winter. And he was abstracting it into primary colors. And when I say abstracting, he was taking away a lot of information and keeping it just red, blue, and yellow, which are the three primary colors of painting. Um, he also was abstracting things in a way later on, this is three years later, where he would take these compositions and he would think, okay, how can I just take the essential qualities of this image? I'm just gonna take the horizontals and the verticals and a little bit of some of the other curves and diagonals. But you can see he's really emphasizing uh, very simple aspects of what he's trying to convey. And gradually he's found that horizontals and verticals actually can provide a lot of visual interest for a rectangle. And so we see that he's going further down away from representation. We've started with this tree that looks very tree-like. We've gone to this that's starting to become circles and rectangles and lines. And we're still, it's still called still life with ginger pot, but now he's abstracting this into sort of more base forms until he gets to this composition 10 in black and white, which is a pier uh, on a river. And he's trying to convey the visual sense of water sparkling on uh, a river. And he's doing this by creating very particular intersections of lines that, um, that meet together, but then because of how they're dispersed, it forces us to look around the rectangle. Um, so this is, so the first one we looked at was 1909. Now we're at 1915. So you have a semester. This is Piet Mondrian taking six years. So I want you to be kind to yourselves as well in this period of development. And then, wow, what's happened? Almost 30 years later, 29 years later, he's created this very reduced um, abstraction, still using those primaries. So he's kept all, a lot of these interests and he's combined this interest of primary color with this question of horizontal and vertical shapes. So he's really playing with these things that he's noticed and he's testing out all these different variations. And if you look further into his practice, you see all these little moments between these big, this big leap um, that make the case even clearer. Uh, this was slightly before the previous one and we get a sense that he, we, we get this illusion where there's sometimes little lighter dots where the black lines intersect with each other. And he's being very careful about where he puts things. He's not doing it randomly. He's creating sketches with tape and he's sort of testing a few things out until he arrives at a composition. And then he makes a decision. He's saying, this composition is doing something very particular and it's valuable and I'm gonna keep uh, exploring that. And then he also explores this in a very playful way. So Piet Mondrian's Broadway Boogie Woogie is from 1942. And by this stage, he's left Europe and he's living in New York. And New York is a very bustling environment. And Boogie Woogie is a kind of uh, jazz that's popular at the time. And this is a very playful kind of image. So if we think about the career of Piet Mondrian, we, we can see sort of the progress of an artist and how an artist needs to work to become a really important artist. And one of the crucial elements of that is taking some elements and being, consist, being playful consistently around those elements. So maybe your element that you'll maintain forever and ever is, for as long as you make art. Maybe that's a long time, maybe it's not. But maybe you just take the circle and you run with it and you go crazy with the circle. And, and so in 40 years time, we'll see these really elaborate, really intricate and playful circle paintings. But this is, there's a dazzlingness here where Piet Mondrian's sort of riffing on the New York nightlife uh, in the 1940s jazz culture. And he's doing this through abstract squares act like beats in a sort of sonic situation. So can we build a Mondrian with code? I have a feeling you might have already done this. Or if not, um, have a go. 
Uh, hopefully now, if you've done the labs, you've put a circle on the internet, you can probably put a, a square in there as well, or a rect. Um, so if you take something simple around an art idea and then explore what the code can do with that, whether that's as we progress using loops, using functions, using um, algorithms to shape it and misshape it. Um, but it really is about that alignment of the tool and the um, idea. So what makes good art? Let's have another look and see what we've come up with. Everyone, all, everyone knows real art is All Star by Smash Mouth. That is a guilty pleasure of mine, so I have to agree. <laughs> as soon as I saw that image, the Katamari theme started playing in my head. Yes, you are anchored into the Katamari world now. Yeah, so if you take one idea from this lecture, the one idea I want you to take is that to make good art, you have to practice, practice, practice. You have to keep, particularly with the p5.js library, the more you play around with it, see what it can do, see what's possible. And if you get to a point where you don't know what to do with the p5.js library, just play with any idea that comes up in the lab, whether that's just putting a circle on the internet and see what the technology can do to push that. Um, so learn the tools. It's definitely worth the effort. Sometimes we have this idea that we need this big idea before we start, but actually the, th the sort of things that we can already do can be the inspiration for the next thing. So playing around with those things that we can do and those things that we have to learn for this week's lab or whatever. Um, and I, I, lo I love the metaphor of the piano. I feel like the computer is just like the piano. Um, the more you practice and the longer you practice, the better you get technically. But then the, if you go even further, you become better than a technical player of the piano. You become a virtuoso that looks like the piano is sort of a part of you and you look emotional and you are emotional and you convey uh, emotion through that tool. So look, that's all I really have for you. Um, Xiaowei Wang, you has asked what library, I think, do you mean the p5.js library? Uh, oh, that's what I meant when I said library. So if I'm saying library and you think I'm talking about a building, uh, I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about the p5.js library. Cool. Well, that's all from me. Are there any questions in the chat? I'll hang around for a little bit and uh, wait to hear of any questions. Maybe if you don't have a question, if you can just type in your favorite artwork that you've ever seen. And then I'll jump on that. Uh, there's some really cool other things that I didn't see. The one on the left doesn't have a plate though. Ah, the coffee cup. Distinguishing factor, a plate. Artworks always have to have a plate. Supersymmetry by Ryoji Ikeda. Ooh, I don't know that one. Oh, yes, I do. It's an installation, I think. Yeah, it's wild. Gaming fan art. Nice. 
Turner and Monet. Morgan likes Mona. I think you mean, do you mean the Museum of Old and New Art? <laughs> Imagine having a single favorite artwork. Can't relate. Is it hard to visualize artwork using the p5.js library? That's a very good question. The art maps in Beat Saber. Albert Namajira, fantastic. Probably the first Australian artist to really understand that particular kind of bluish smokiness from the eucalypt. Yeah. These are all really great. Keep thinking about it. Uh, keep making notes, save images, put them in a folder or some kind of visual diary if you can. Um, a lot of these responses are also drawings and paintings, so thinking about how they can relate to, to a sort of interactive digital context is going to be really interesting. And also how then um, does that trigger any ideas about your favorite digital artworks that have ever been made. I look forward to seeing you all again next week. Until then, have a lovely afternoon and a good weekend. Bye.